I wouldn't call it failure because I learned so crazy much from this. When you're a young entrepreneur, it's extremely hard to know what to do and what not to do. So you end up wasting so much time working on the wrong stuff, or they don't have the funding, or they don't have the capabilities, or they don't know how to raise capital. Like raising capital for deep tech startups is one of the most challenging things. People talk about an MBA being crazy expensive when it's, what is it now, maybe, who knows, $25,000 or $40,000. And that is crazy expensive. And here I come with 52 million euros. There's a difference between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome, and we've popped over the pond. <laughs> I have Hovard with me. I don't actually know what country he's in. He said Norwegian earlier, but I don't feel like that's a country. I don't know what's going on. I'm showing my lack of education on this part of the world. But we got introduced <laughs> through Tracy Clark. She was a guest on the podcast a few weeks ago. If you guys don't remember that episode, you absolutely need to jump on and check that one out because she dropped a ton of jewels and we dove deep on some of the most important topics for those of you who are trying to take things to the next level. Now, Hovart, I opened the show by asking the guests a simple question. So you had an exit. I had two, actually. You've had two exits. Okay. You don't look old enough to have two exits, but we'll dig into that in a second. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show. Um, I know the uh, time zones are off, so it's probably pretty early where you are right now. Um, it's actually pretty late. It's a pretty late. In the even, e evening. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You're, you're the man. You're a gentleman for sure. So let's talk about exits. Um, so what kind of companies did you build like give us the backstory so well the backstory kind of it, it, it obviously started the way before the the exits uh and i'm a serial entrepreneur since 22 years i'm 44 years old now and uh yeah the journey really started uh well the entrepreneurial journey started 22 years ago but even before that it started because i grew up in a founder's family so my dad was the founder uh and i think it it's deeply rooted in the mindset and what kind of training do you get as a kid? Uh, how do you view the world? How do you how do you set yourself up for uh, some of the cool stuff? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my background, I, I, I decided to go to uh, uh, take a master in business and economics. And my in my master thesis, I actually studied the uh, Norwegian successful entrepreneurs and what do the best ones do differently than anyone else or all the others and you know getting a uh, first-hand insight into these type of uh, mindsets from those who have actually built uh, very successful businesses uh, as a 21 22 year old at the time uh, was uh, definitely part of forming my mindset for my own entrepreneurial journey so yeah i was quite young when i when i finished my master i was 22 years old uh, and um I went uh, right off to establish uh, my first startup. It was an IT startup, and we did uh, actually some some pretty cool stuff. We uh, we uh, this was in in advertising, and we were able to launch some videos uh, very quickly. And this is back in the days where sort of bandwidth was a huge issue. It was like two thousand two, two thousand three, uh, and the the internet was. Uh, very different <laughs> compared to what it is today. So sort of launching something quickly was uh, was a unique feature. And we, we were actually able to do a, a eBay campaign uh, to, to get it with eBay uh, globally for a, a, a big advertising campaign. And we thought uh, now we really hit the sort of the golden bird, you know. Uh, and, uh, and then I was in a DD process with a few investors. Uh, and I needed the I, I really needed the investment to come in because uh, you know you run out of cash if you don't get an investment during the dd process they actually pulled uh, pulled away so i was left there with way too high cost and not enough liquidity and i was oh. like shit <laughs> 25 years old and sort of looking at my first yeah no no i, I wouldn't call it failure because i learned so crazy much from this mm -hmm. but 
um, a, f- a year later, we uh, the, the company filed for insolvency. And and uh, I was 25 years old, and I was working crazy hours, like three. I was actually logging my hours. It was like 3,000, 3,500 hours a year, which is which is pretty crazy. Uh, but you you know you you accumulate a lot of uh, insights and learnings from all these. Uh, crazy hours <laughs> the problem was that we uh, when you're a young entrepreneur it's extremely hard to know what to do and what not to do so you end up wasting so much time working on the wrong stuff and your inexperience is trapping you or your mindset is trapping you and the only way to kind of get out of this is to work with really experienced people, kind of tap into their minds, uh, be humble, know that you uh, you have some wrong assumptions, even if you don't know which one of them are wrong. And, you know, this is a, this is a little hard stuff, like this uh, being aware of your blind spots, uh, because obviously you don't think that your, your own assumptions are wrong. But with experience, it comes to sort of, realization that I am wrong in some of these key assumptions. And I want to find those errors in my thinking as quickly as I can. I don't want to work, develop a product for two years and, and figure out that there is no customer willing to actually buy this for the price I assume. You know, you, you, you rather check these very key assumptions extremely early. I, I went on to, to work in a, in a, a company that did an IPO. I was sort of the local CFO, uh, was a solar cell production, um, actually making the, the crystalline solar cells produ- that later are producing uh, energy from the sun. And uh, it was a very high-tech uh, company. Uh, 100 and, we, we invested 100 million euros in, in uh, some production lines producing these solar cells. And um, we grew the company from 88 employees to 330. Mm-hmm. And uh, as as a 26 year old, I got this uh, this responsibility to manage the the accounting and the controlling and and all the economy stuff for this uh, this company. Uh, and that was pretty crazy because you know 26 years old. Come on, you're you're. You're quite young at that age, but I had actually accumulated a lot of experience from my first startup. So I, I kind of, I, I wouldn't say I was a senior because I clearly wasn't, but uh, I did have some experience working with investors and working with, uh, you know, financial uh, modeling and these kind of things. So, so um, I did that for a few years, and uh, and uh, you know, investing 100 million euros is a quite a lot of money. Uh, we our budgets were like reaching, I think, 200 million euros in, in revenues. And uh, so it was crazy growth. And then uh, and then I got uh, sort of an ID when, when I was uh, 27. Um, uh, one of the problems I saw in the solar cell production was that there was no um, takers of some of the B-grade solar cells. And I had some thoughts, so maybe I could... Uh, maybe I could uh, figure out a, a, a better way to kind of take the, this intrinsic value of these them and upgrade them and get some working solar cells instead of basically throwing them away. And we, uh, so I went to some venture capitalists, uh, the best ones in, in the Nordics. And uh, I, I kind of asked if this could be of, of their interest. And at the same time, I was evaluating if this was a, uh, worth uh, worth it for me, you know, to to quit a job and go uh, go uh, into the entre- entrepreneurship again, you know, having worked these uh, all these crazy hours. Is that really what you want? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I I, um, I they got they really like this. Uh, I like that, and uh, we 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 formed uh, up a, a team. And in two thousand eight, when I was twenty eight, I I. Uh, we launched this company and took this from my own ID to 180 employees, 35 million euros in revenue, three factories. And uh, 
now you may think that that's the exit story, but it actually isn't. <laughs> what? <laughs> you went from zero to 35 million euros, 300 yeah. employees. 180 employees. Oh, so 180 and, uh, some, employees. Some, some, uh, some really, really good people that I was fortunate enough to work together with. And then came this solar winter. This was like in the, in the solar business. And, uh, and uh, it was a massive oversupply of, of uh, products. So people started selling products below the actual cost of making them, like the actual cash cost of making them. Uh, and, and that, like, that is kind of a nightmare because the more you sell, the more you lose, but if you don't sell anything, you, you are stuck with, you know, your, your products and you, you, you certainly die. So how can you survive in this environment for that lasted basically two, uh, yeah, about two years. And most of the European solar cell business, uh, kind of, uh, shut down because of all of this, because it's, you, you know, you, you don't have access to free capital. Uh, no investors are willing to invest into something that is uh, losing money, whatever you do. And we eventually, in 2015, we shut down this business. Uh, and uh, on the way to court, where, because I was the one who had to file for um, admi administrative close down or sort of the insolvency of the company, and the, the chairman of the board uh, called me and he, uh, and you know it was a really dark day for me <laughs> and he said well well hover this isn't so bad for you you have norway's most expensive mba 52 million euros it has cost us go use that for something good oh my god <laughs> and and uh, that actually really shifted my sort of mindset and and uh, you know it's okay we we actually did some crazy cool stuff we were very successful in the start. And then uh, this negative spiral came and this market environment was completely crazy. And we filed for this insolvency. But sort of for those seven, eight years, I was in, I was uh, the founder and the, the CFO of, of this company. Uh, I, I worked with some super cool and great people amongst those three CEOs. We did some, some fantastic things. And, and I really sort of thought of this as, uh, wow, a 52 million euro MBA. Who has that? Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah, you, you actually learn a lot during these uh, seven, eight years when you work with the really brilliant people. Your, your, your mindset is formed, the, the way of conducting yourself the, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you you actually learn from all of this, and then it's like, okay, he said, go go use that for something good, and uh, and I did, and the so then we're coming to the sort of the this is sort of the backstory before my 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 uh, uh, the, the two exits and. 2015, I was standing there and I was basically wondering, what in the world should I do now? You know, uh, I, I've spent seven, eight years on on this uh, startup. Uh, I've been working, raising about 100 million euros in in financing for these uh, for for my company. Uh, I, I've been working with very professional investors. I, I've learned how they think, how they conduct themselves, how they work. Um, I was like, okay, what, what, how, how can I sort of use this, uh, all these insights for, for good, really? And um, I kicked off a, uh, actually two, two sort of initiatives at the same, uh, almost the same time. Uh, one was a, a synthetic diesel uh, case um, where you can basically reverse the diesel process. So you can create create diesel out of water and electricity and CO2. Uh, and we, we uh, developed this for a f well, well, almost five, six years. And, uh, and then uh, the, the other founders, uh, because I was involved in, in uh, some other stuff and I couldn't sort of really devote all my capacity to, to this company. Uh, so they decided to to uh, 
buy me out um in in a in a very friendly way and and um yeah that was uh, sort of one of my exits uh and after that the company has developed uh, very successfully so i obviously exited way too early <laughs> but still it was a <laughs> it was a very nice a very nice exit um and and then the other company was uh, i was doing a data center um and this was uh, this was um i, I kind of looked in my in, in immediate uh, surrounding here in in northern part of norway and there are sort of quite little industrial use, like industries. There are not not too many industries up here, and I have been working in the in the energy sort of uh, sector for about a decade, uh, and it happened that we we actually had the lowest cost of electricity uh, in all of Europe, right. and not only that, it was all powered by hydro uh, electricity, so green energy. And it was kind of a huge excess of this green energy that was just laying around, or sort of it was it was not possible to even transport out of the region because of the the current uh, or the 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 line limitations and everything. So you basically had like, like this this uh, suboptimal market where a huge amount of uh, green electricity was uh, was locked in, and I kind of went uh, or or started to figure out okay what 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 kind of good use could we use could we make out of this it was uh, sort of in it was a, basically a 1 gigawatt of of uh, uh, excess uh, electricity and that amounts to sort of the largest data center in the world if you can put this in uh, in an industrial setting so i kicked off this project um i I was able to buy uh, some 640,000 square meters of land, which is really a lot of land uh, for almost nothing. Uh, and we started, we kicked off a process to to uh, get uh, some architects to design this and to uh, uh, and and to how to finance this and everything. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, so so yeah, actually it's a really really cool project. Uh, and then uh, came a company that wanted to acquire us, uh, and I didn't want to sell. But sort of a short story, a long story made short. Uh, the my co-founders wanted to, and we sold the company for ten million euros. Uh, and did you have revenue? No, no, no. Nothing was built. I even. It was just yeah. so, 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 so. What, why? Okay, that, and and this is kind of a, um, it's it's a, it's a very cool cool story. The access to all this green electricity was pretty insane, actually. Uh, you know, today uh, and 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 in the years later, or Google and all these big uh, big companies are buying this uh, huge. Uh, Lands that they wanted that that they will buy they they will construct data centers on, and we had access to uh, one gigawatt of electricity. So we launched a, a project uh, called Colos with the intent to build the largest data center in the world uh, in in northern Norway. I, I went live on BBC World News to uh, talk about this uh, data center. Uh, and uh, and uh, we got uh, eight hundred international articles about my data center, <laughs> uh, and it was a huge PR thing. It was like the most uh, talked about data center in the world, really. <laughs> and and uh, and then we uh, this this uh, uh, buyer came and they 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 purchased it and. So it never became a, the, the data center I wanted. Uh, and, and when you stand there and you sort of you you work years for something and and you have a plan and then someone comes and just wants a very different thing and uh, you know people are motivated by different things. I was motivated by creating lots of jobs and creating this uh, in in my local surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even though I didn't want to sell, I I was. 
I figured it was probably better to sell them to go into sort of huge, huge conflicts or or stuff like that. And we um, so so I sold and and that basically changed my 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 life, of course, uh, in a in a very good way. Um, and uh, after that, I could sort of really do more or less what I uh, yeah more, more or less what I wanted. Uh, and what do you do when you when you don't have to be an employee? Uh, well, for me, I was like I, I was really thinking about this for for a long time. And after this, I uh, I've founded multiple startups. Um, and in 2019, so one year after this exit, I founded a nanotech company because I was. I was actually annoyed. Why, why do I have to wash my car? It's such a stupid thing. Why do I have to wash my car? It gets dirty all the time. And whatever car you make, if it's a Lamborghini or if it's a Volkswagen or a BMW, you have to wash them all or Tesla. Why hasn't anyone figured out this stupid dirt problem? As I was starting to think about the, sort of these... Uh, yeah, what I thought was sort of worthy problems to 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 solve, and I met some, I met a guy that had a PhD in material science, and uh, we uh, he had insights into nanotechnology, and we kicked up this uh, company Nanice together in 2019, so, so yeah, five years ago, and this is one of my sort of deep tech companies. We have developed. Um, coating that is more slippery than Teflon. And like everyone knows Teflon, the cooking ware and everything, you know, and Teflon has a lot of bad stuff in it. Uh, some, some forever chemicals, it doesn't degrade. It's about to be banned in, in the EU now and soon also US. And nobody has a replacement or an alternative for this, uh, of course, very useful product, but, but quite harmful. And we developed this uh, this solution uh, that uh, these multi-billion-dollar companies have uh, not figured out. So this is one of the the companies I'm uh, I have now. Uh, it's um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I think there will be a, another exit, uh, not not too far in the future. Uh, I because... hope we have the IP protected. <laughs> Holy smokes! Oh, absolutely, man. absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it's very important and. Uh, it actually happens. Uh, so so happens that the the, the CEO of the, this company, because I don't want to be CEO. Uh, I've been working with uh, world class CEOs for for many many years, and this is not sort of my my thing. I I love the early phase. Uh, I know the 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 CFO sort of how to fund things and stuff like that. Um, so the the CEO in this company was uh, also the one of the CEOs in in my solar company. Uh, so um, we we worked together before. He used to work for the largest solar cell manufacturer in the world, twenty thousand employees. Uh, he had a top management position in in that company, chief operating officer, and a brilliant guy. And because when you develop these uh, trustful relationships, and then you you know it's it's really friendships, and. Uh, he uh, he came back and and wanted to work with with uh, heading up this uh, nanice this uh, nanotech company. So he's running this company now, uh, and uh, yeah, we're we're solving some pretty cool stuff. Uh, I, I yeah I, I I love this. So uh, um, we I, I have a few of these uh, sort of companies that I think are solving really worthy problems together with brilliant people, and this is kind of my mantra these days. The, the the key thing is how to convince yourself about a problem being really worthy. You know, when you can work on a million different things, why do you choose exactly this or that? And how do you know that this is uh, something you will sustain for the long term? And are you really passionate about this? Like, does this actually mean something for you to uh, to, to to fix? And um, and these are some of the sort of core questions and sort of 
if you do uh, if you find this uh, this uh, really worthy problems to solve and you find brilliant people well then it's not just about sort of making another exit it's about having fun on the journey having uh, you know doing stuff that most people think is completely crazy and not and not possible but it is possible uh, if you uh, if you put together the right fundament and the right people it's completely possible so uh, this uh, this uh, yeah, my, my my exits weren't sort of the end of anything. It was the start of of a new era, where I'm in this uh, fortunate position where I can really work with uh, super smart people, have a sort of ecosystem around myself where I can do the things I love to do. And you mentioned Tracy, and Tracy Tracy is actually one of my coach. Uh, it's my coach. I've been work, work, working with her since. Um, about three years now uh, and uh, I love working with her we have these uh, quarterly reviews every every three months we we spend like three hours together uh, to to challenge the thinking the assumptions uh, how did it go what, what was good what was not good uh, so I know her pretty well or at least she knows me very well <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's it's really interesting because <clears throat> of the way that you frame the exits you basically made it so that the ones that had financial gain significant financial gain as the ones that were exits but each time in every business venture that we have there's going to come a point where our relationship ends with that relation with that business and so for me you've had four exits on the low side when we talk about the first one where uh, you guys ended up being insolvent. And then the second one with the venture capital, I can't remember if it was venture capital or private equity, but yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. it was, yeah. Um, yeah. you had those folks come in. Uh, those experiences, from my perspective, um, are the things that set you up for the second two. Absolutely. And I, I think so many people would have packed it up after the second one and said, I'm not cut out for this. I'm just going to go be an employee. And, you know, there's too much risk. There's too much. I lost too much. It was too much sacrifice. But you decided that I'm going to keep going. I just got to find the right problem. Is that right? Or you think uh, I'm making it easier than it no, was? No, I think, I, no, I think that's uh, like, I'm. It, it's all about figuring out what do you love to do and for me i love to take on these very complex um i i, I don't take on complex projects because of the complexity but i take on projects that i think are really worthy problems to be solving that maybe not so many others dare to solve or they don't have the funding or they don't have the capabilities or they don't know how to raise capital like raising capital for deep tech startups is one of the most challenging things. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, but now I raised like $140 million for my different startups. Of course we can raise capital. Come on. I've done it many times now. Uh, and it's possible. But you have to convince yourself first that this is actually really worth it and that you you have uh, qualified your assumptions and that you... you And once you have that conviction, you my strong point is is sort of conveying the enthusiasm that I have and feel and my conviction. And that's like, but this is so obvious. This is so worth it to solve. Is it risky? Yes, of course it's risky. All startups comes with risk. What do you mean? You, you want to, to invest uh, with, uh, with uh, safe returns, go to the bank. Uh, if you want to have a, a great upside doing something meaningful, but with risk, yeah, maybe maybe this is your thing. Uh, so um, yeah, I have a f I have a few of these uh, sort of startups now, deep tech startups. So another one that I'm doing is uh, it's, it's like completely <laughs> completely crazy cool uh, startup. So we we I found this professor who has been who, who discovered that hydrogen has a conden new condensate form. Uh, and in this form, there are there are spontaneous nuclear processes happening that you can measure. 
and it's not fission and it's not fusion, but it's uh, something called annihilation. Uh, so he's actually found a way to create antimatter. And if you go into, like, I'm a little nerdy on the tech stuff. Sorry, sorry for that. But sort of, if you go into the the, the physics, uh, all all matter has their own antiparticles, so called antimatter. And uh, he discovered a way to to create these antimatter in 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 his own little reactor. And I thought it was just such a brilliant thing. And I said, and basically, no one believed it. And I was like. I was reading some of his research and I I was complete, completely fascinated with this guy. And I, and I reached out to him and I said, I think you're completely right. Let's, let's found a company together and I'll take care of the funding and let's prove to the world that we can actually do this. Hey guys, as you might know, a very small percentage of the people who actually listen to this podcast are subscribers. So do us a favor, subscribe. In fact, we did some analytics and we found out that only 25% of the people who listen are subscribers. And our goal is to get that to about 75% over the next three months. So do us a favor, hit the subscribe button so you get notified when our new episodes come. We plan to bring immense value to you guys going forward as we continue to improve the content that we created at Dreamcast. Your dreams should be real. And this I did in, in 2021. Uh, and now it's a it's a very repeatable process. We we do we uh, still most people think is is uh, crazy that we can we, we should not be able to do what we're doing, but we are doing it. And it's sort of challenging uh, uh, some some known physics uh, with the with the real data on the measurements, and we're able to. Yeah, to to uh, release a lot of energy uh, through this uh, small reactor we have, and here we have a chance to change energy in the world if we succeed with what we're doing. And is that a worthy problem to be solving? I guess so, huh? isn't it? <laughs> you guess so. Come on, what are we talking about? <laughs> this is world changing stuff. <laughs> So these are the kind of things I I get super fascinated uh, about, uh, like really really worthy problems. Uh, to solve together with brilliant people, and for some reason, I I I get so fascinated with these brilliant minds, and you know, it doesn't help to just have a technical insight or a deep knowledge on the technical side if you want to to start up something. You also need the the business side and the the, the finance and the getting investors and all of that. So it it works. As, as a partnership, it works really well uh, to uh, to sort of use my my experience and competence to help set up the right structure and to attract the right type of people in to who wants to change the world or do some some crazy stuff. So you said you raised one hundred and forty million euros already. Right. Dollars, yep, yep. <clears throat> Dollars, euros. <laughs> All right. How does one get to the place where they feel comfortable bringing in that much capital from other people? Because I don't imagine that you could pay all of that back if something didn't work out. No, and, but, but I think it's very, I think it's very important to understand the logic of the investors. How does it actually work? And I was working with professional venture capital, like the best uh, in, in Scandinavia. I was part of a fund, a uh, 160 million euro fund, uh, and they invested 15 million euros in my company, and they invested 15 million euros in Spotify, uh, and they invested uh, 10 to 15 million euros in other companies, and the general partner at this venture ca uh, venture capital company that was the chairman of the of the board in my company. He said that we're making these bets. We know from history that out of 10, six will not make it. Three will be pretty good and one will be completely stellar. The only problem is that we don't know who. And this, the, 
the star may take quite some time to to work on to 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 yeah to make it really shine and to to become the star uh and and that is the challenge and we know that this one star will pay for all the others so in this in the they were one of the early investors in spotify and they made much more returns than the entire fund just on that spotify investment and in my company they actually lost 15 million euros but you think that they they cried over that when they got their star? No, uh, and that was why the 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 chairman of the board was relaxed, and he he said it like as like I started. You you have uh, Norway's most expensive MBA, fifty two million euros. It has cost us. Go use that for something good. And he, there was no bitterness. There was no hard feelings and. Despite the fact that we uh, we uh, gave up on this, uh, or the investors gave up on this company eventually because of this extremely difficult market, that of course no one could have predicted uh, in the early days that it was going to be like this. So, so I think it as long as you understand that picture, then well, it, it it's not re uh, well. Of course, it's a, you should do something meaningful where you can pay back the investors money always. You should never sort of make bets that the, where the chance is for no payback. But on along the road, there are so many things that that happen that you don't you don't that you have no control over. And for instance, to 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 make a familiar example, I just read this Elon Musk book from uh, from uh, that was uh, came out a few months ago. Um, and if you read the what what really happen with Tesla and SpaceX at the worst period in 2008 he was so close to bankruptcy like literally maybe days or a week away from bankruptcy not only one of them but probably both of them because they were he had invested all his fortune in these two companies and he was able to pull it through and they made these uh they, they came through that but sort of the if if people only knew how razor thin that blade is that the balance between the success and and what people call failure then they they wouldn't be so harsh on judging the failures uh and in my vocabulary failure is not even allowed as a negative thing because what is a failure well, to me, failure is only a failure if you fail to learn from these experiences. And in every opportunity in life, there is always something to learn. So why in the world are people so harsh on failure? As you said, the two the stepping stones for me were these two journeys before my two exits. And them they qualified me for doing something good and and those two axes qualified me for the next era doing some crazy cool things so 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 what is failure and why why should why in the world should we be so afraid of this and it's like if you talk to your you have, do you have kids yeah two two girls yeah so uh, <laughs> so i have a i have a girl and a boy and if you if you when they start to do do something, none of them can do things in a proper way. Oh, so you weren't able to do this? Do you call out your failure of your of your daughter? Come on, of course you encourage her to to keep on trying. But when we when we grow up, there are so many people that are so brutal and so harsh with no insights, and they judge you harshly. And it's like, come on, guys. Give it another try. Okay, now you learned. You won't do the same thing again. Uh, now you you enter the next phase with more wisdom. Why 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 should we be so hard on 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 each other? Yeah, I think a lot of people are that strict or that tough when they want to make other people smaller so that they feel bigger. I think anybody who is pushing against their limit knows what it's like to go past or to go over the edge. 
And so I think they have a little more compassion when people don't have the success that I guess they were trying to or striving to achieve. Um, it's only the people that haven't done a lot that I see that are very critical about those who don't do. <laughs> and I think that is actually pretty spot on. Those who have done the, 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 the least are often those who are the most critical. Those who have experience, they, they, uh, they understand that, uh, well, at least starting up things is a, is a risky business and the statistics are against you. Uh, and, but, Come on, give it another try. Try, try, and try again, and uh, and then uh, eventually you will figure out something good. And I think it's also what is success really? Is it material things that really make you happy? Well, at least not for me. For me, it's uh, there whole other a whole other dimension of what is success. And for me, it's uh, it's my it's it's my family. It's it's uh, how how I can live my life. What the things I can do now, where I can do exactly what I want, these are these are successes. Uh, like in the sense that these are the things I want in my life. Uh, whatever amount, uh, well, of course, the, the financial freedom is is a is a great thing, and 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 that enables certain things that if you compare to when you don't have this, but the an exit is is not uh, it. If you think of this as blessing, well, yes, it may, but it may also not be. I've seen many sort of founders who made exits who kind of turned a really good life into something quite miserable because they lose their energy, they lose the passion, and all of a sudden they start to worry about money. And I was like, well, why? Like, well, why do you want to go into that mode? <laughs> uh so um i chose was, to do the stuff stuff i love and uh, i thought you were going to say the success is being able to work on problems or solve problems that you think are worthy to be solved is and that's that what i love for you yeah that is what i love so yes exactly <laughs> I, I thought I that would come out eventually it, it's interesting because it's what most people do is define themselves as what they do to earn money. You threw that all out the window when you were talking about success and you talked about what I do with my family. Sure. Money is part of that. Cause you've got to pay for the stuff that you do, but it's like, what do I do with my family? You add in the component of solving problems and life gets pretty fulfilling. And we found that to be the formula for people post exit that want to actually feel successful still is doing the things that they love with the people that they love is the thing that gives them the most enjoyment and fulfillment. The thing hmm. that we didn't talk about that I'm really curious about, and I, I don't know where your perspective is because we haven't explored this at all, but how on the day after you close the business that you guys lost 50 million, 50 million euros on, what was that like? Because I imagine you didn't roll into a new job. I feel like you probably had some time off to actually reflect and think about what happened. Yeah, I was I was very focused on keeping the integrity um, all the way to to always be very transparent and you know don't 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 lose people even when you're in this uh, sort of uh, very difficult position. So I actually got uh, I, I got contacted by the bank uh, who had uh, collateral in the business, and they wanted me to uh, to help close things. Uh, so they actually engaged me, uh, yeah, right right away, to work with them. And you know, I've been working with them since uh, almost seven eight years. Um, so there was like a very good uh, and solid relationship. So I spent sort of the next uh, three, four months on on uh, just cleaning up and, and settling things in a good way and, and helping the bank. And and so th there was no sort of empty period, actually. There was, uh, yeah, meaningful things. And, and uh, I, I was working as a, as a consultant uh, 
and and helping them out in a business that I knew basically inside out. And I was actually quite happy about this because, you know, you you don't leave uh, the mess for someone else to clean up. You you kind of you, you you clean up after yourself and you help them out and they were really appreciative of this and and then during that time I, I of course had a lot of questions so, so what 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 comes next what what should I do and and uh, but I still got some time to to sort of reflect on that and and uh, that was sort of the beginning of the of the these two exits uh, so. Um, no, it it wasn't so uh, it wasn't so bad, and actually, this mind shift that the chairman offered uh, as a as a gift uh, on this very end, uh, this this the day on the of the insolvency, this actually completely shifted my my mindset um, to appreciate that I have been fortunate enough to actually be able to work with all these great people and learn so much, and and you know. Uh, People talk about an MBA being crazy expensive when it's, what is it now? Maybe, who knows, $25,000 or $40,000. And that is crazy and expensive. And here I come with 52 million euros. <laughs> so, go figure. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, I thought that was... Uh, that uh, actually uh, helped me helped me a lot. This uh, it, it's it's seriously it it took him two minutes to say this, but it was actually uh, like offering a gift uh, to me uh, at the at a day that was yeah quite dark. You know, you you spent seven eight years of your life, and now it's over. <laughs> they pulled like, the why plug. Did... Yeah, and and it was. You know, it's 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 quite hard. You 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 invest a lot of yourself and yeah, your life into something, and then it's over. <laughs> so so, um, but this these few words really shifted my mindset, and and I think that is kind of a yeah a wisdom to bring forward uh, for for young entrepreneurs or or even more experienced ones that sort of don't. Sometimes it it ends up in in uh, not being what you intended, but still, you can learn a lot. And and I think this is sort of a learning journey. And the more you learn, the the, the wiser you get. And and looking back, when I was twenty two years old, and I started to say that I was working crazy hours because I didn't know what to prioritize. But now I do. Now I do. Now I know exactly how to qualify my assumptions how to convince myself if this is a, something that is really worth it and i can use that those skills to do something that most of uh, most other people don't have the experience to do and i try to i actually try to teach uh, this to to uh, some founders uh, locally uh, that sort of at the beginning of the journey and then after i, I had like three courses uh, three uh, over a few years and it just really dawned on me how much I knew and how difficult it for it was for them to kind of assimilate all of this. And that was kind of when the, the value of this uh, MBA really dawned on me that, well, you you learn the, the processes, the methods, the you learn how these investors think and how they work and what they look for. And that is not easy to actually just transfer. That that has to be lived through, and that is the sort of the real value of this uh, life MBA. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured out that okay, instead of sort of trying to help other others do this, uh, I, I I know what to do. I can do this much quicker myself, and I have I can get basically a, a huge part of the upside because uh, I can get things established and I can raise capital and we can do these. Uh, cool things that most people think are very difficult and funding deep tech startups is very difficult because because you don't have a proof of concept when you start and it may take millions to 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 get to proof of concept so you need a lot of faith and you need a lot you need to understand how people work and and that investors also invest in people in 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 solving actually worthy problems in a in in a, in a probable way but 
as long as you can't prove it at day one, well, what do you have? Well, it's really sort of how to structure this story and and first and foremost to convince yourself that this is actually worth it. Uh, and and once you have that conviction, you and you have challenged your assumptions and you you talk to customers, you talk to partners, you talk to the best people in the world in this area, you get the br- raw and brutal feedback, which is key elements to convincing yourself. Then you have something that is actually uh, fundable. So that's my that's my sweet spot. These are the things I love to do. That's beautiful. (laughs) So as we kind of wrap this one up, the so many places I want to go. I want to go here. So you get the check or the wire. It's more money than you ever had in your account at one time, your personal account. How'd you feel? Was it worth it? Yeah, it was a relief. Uh, you know, when most people don't see the all the efforts it takes to get you to that. I had taken a uh, hundred thousand dollars in loans, uh, and that that is quite a huge investment. Uh, and you know, if if things fail, you 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 may be indebted for quite some time. And when when you check that, well, when when you when you get that exit and and the the payout payout day is there, uh, it was really a relief uh, that at least this one <laughs> paid off well and and it didn't go into you know, uh, insolvency or bankruptcy or anything. It it uh, it was actually a yeah a good day, uh, and then after this day, then I had the really sort of reflection time. What in the world should I be doing now? Mm-hmm. And what are really we- worthy problems to to uh, to do? And I was I've been through after that. I was probably through a hundred different things I could do. Uh, but you need to kind of shift through a lot of these things until you find something that is you, you're really passionate about. And uh, well, Nanice was this nanotech company was one of the things I was passionate about. And and you know when we developed the most slippery surface on the planet, and could prove that. Well, and then now we funded this company with uh, three four million euros. Uh, we made great progress in these five years. Uh, as I said, the multi-billion dollar companies are not even close to doing what we're able to do. So it's completely possible to, if you if you set your, your mind on the right things and you work together with great people, it's possible. This is so, so cool. Um, Our four-step process for people who get to the backside of it and they're figuring out what's next uh, is nourish, explore, or nourish, evaluate, explore, and then transcend. And that's literally what you did. You took the time to reflect and you nourished. Uh, and then you were evaluating the different options, right? Shifting through the things. And then you found the one. And then you use your curiosity with the um, the surface and working with the doctor to make the thing actually work. And now you're going and transcending by sharing that solution with the world and you know, eventually you'll get another exit on the backside of this because it solves a really big problem. And and actually, so, there's a fun a fun little anecdote there also because the same chairman that uh, talked about my 52 million euro MBA, I called him after my exit, and he was so happy for me. Uh, and he and he gave me one uh, one advice that I can uh, sort of put forward, and he he said to me, "Whatever you do now, Howard." Take your time and please don't invest in the stock market uh, because now you you had a, a good, you had a great exit 
uh, be very careful. And and I think that there are some uh, there is a lot of wisdom in that also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. I, it's funny because <laughs> most people would say that's the safest place to go i see a lot of founders on the back side of their exit start investing in things that they don't understand and i think that's even yeah. more dangerous than investing in the stock market but what's really cool is you've taken the stuff and I, you've put your capital in things that you're curious about you're exploring and you have some base knowledge of the understanding or the workings of it so that you can actually um, have a impact on the outcome, which I think is so important for us as entrepreneurs and founders is our ability to influence the outcome. And I did, the, I did the invest a, a sort of a little into the stock market and, uh, you know, I wanted to, to try it out and test it out. And, but I, I just feel that this is absolutely not for me. Like you get so, focused on graphs and developments and use and and you can basically do nothing with what's happening uh yes of course you can sit tight and you can do this or that but but uh, you you kind of get into a flow that is for me it was not the right thing so i decided that okay this is uh it, it was actually a very good advice from this uh this uh, vc uh and and uh, i i i decided to 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 leave this and actually do the things I really love, uh, and and uh, go back to sort of the the yeah the the things I knew, uh, as you said, uh, investing in a stock market is a is a trade in itself, and you you compete now even worse you compete with AI and everything, uh, so so um, you better be uh, <laughs> really passionate about that if you uh, if you uh, want to to do this uh, full time and. I decided this was absolutely not for me. So, but uh, the startup side, that is for me. <laughs> He's a builder, y'all. He's a builder. He gets the plane off the ground for sure. Hover, thank you so much for being a guest on the Dreamcatchers podcast. You are the epitome of a dream catcher, man. You, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Failure is failing to learn. I mean, there were so many gems dropped during this episode. The journey is super inspiring. And even the understanding of the way that venture capitalists think about the dollars when they're being deployed uh, just was a mindset shift because I think so many people out there are terrified to go into debt for a business. And we're also always taught that we can borrow stuff to consume, right? We can borrow mm -hmm. stuff to get a car or some of this other stuff, but to go in debt for business take money from other people to help it grow and expand is something many people shy away from and it stifles their growth. And you have had a tremendous track record of raising money and through the four or five deals or businesses you've led, you know, you've been able to have some successful exits. And my hope is that, you know, you'll continue to have that success and be able to inspire more people to actually pursue and achieve the dreams that have been placed on their heart so that then they can then have the freedom to go work on the problems that they really believe should be solved. And I mean, you're a living example of that. So thank you so much for sharing that with our audience. Uh, thank you, Jerome. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you like this. Uh, I think it's interesting, this uh, whole sort of, uh, this, uh, yeah, make, making these exits and what do you do before and after? And uh, that's basically your life. And and uh, you 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 got to figure out what are the the really key things for you and uh, what you love to do and and stick with that. And why wouldn't you stick with that? Come on, when you love it, you 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 love it. <laughs> so why 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 do something else? So I'm in this fortunate position that I am I can do the stuff I love and and it happens to be working with solving really worthy problems together with brilliant people. Solving really worthy problems with brilliant people. All right, thank you so much. And to our listeners, we'll catch you on the next episode. Your dreams should be real.